This is an exclusive hot air. Welcome, welcome all to this episode of the White of How podcast where we explore adventures in STEM. After an amazing candlewide science fair a few months ago, I wanted to check in with our Platinum and Best Project Award winners to learn more about their science fair projects and the adventures they've had along the way. Today, I'm joined by Annabelle Rayson, a grade 12 student from Landon County Science Fair and our Senior Best Project Award Discover winner at Candlewide Science Fair 2022 for her project, Plankton Wars, an innovative analysis of Daphnia genotype biomanipulation for algae bloom prevention. <laughs> what a mouthful. <laughs> Annabelle has also recently won the 2022 Stockholm Junior Water Prize and won third prize for her project at this year's European Union Contest for Young Scientists. So, she's been busy these past few months since Canada White Science Fair, that's for sure. Annabelle, welcome to the podcast. Hello, and thank you so much for having me on. Of course, thank you for being here. Did you want to start us off by introducing yourself a little bit and talking about your project? Um, absolutely. So my name is Annabelle and I'm a grade 12 student in Sarnia, Ontario, and I've been participating in science fairs since the fourth grade. So annually in my local Lambton County Science Fair. And then I've done three Canada-wide science fairs. So one in 2019, which was the last in-person fair we've had when I was in grade eight. And then virtually, um, I believe it was themed to Ottawa in 2021. And then this year again, virtually themed to New Brunswick in 2022. Um, so my project this year is called Plankton Wars, um, and essentially it's a continuation from my research last year where I compared different species of freshwater zooplankton to see which one is able to reduce the most algae to treat and prevent harmful algae blooms. From that research, I discovered that Daphnia magna is the ideal uh, freshwater species for this, and so my research this year essentially focused on comparing different genotypes of the species, as there are a variety of them, and that way they could lead to finding the ideal genotype for algae bloom reduction, can help us to streamline the process of biomanipulation, which is when you manipulate an ecosystem to create a desired effect. And so from there, I discovered that genotype 4 is the ideal genotype to do this. And from there, I tested in different environmental conditions, as we know that our freshwater ecosystems are very dynamic. So I found that genotype 4 of Daphnia magna is the best species to treat and prevent harmful algae blooms and can effectively do this in nutrient and plastic polluted environments, as well as in a variety of levels of algae toxicity and it can have its health and success improve through calcium carbonate and naturally occurring aquatic microbes. <laughs> Did you tell that you've uh, presented that a few different times? <laughs> you just had that spiel off the top of your head, ready to go. <laughs> Didn't even need to look at the camera. You just had it all up here, ready ready for that. <laughs> and I mean, perfect. What, a, what an interesting project. Um, I'm excited to learn more. But firstly, where did this idea come from? Tell us, where did you? how did you ever think of this? Um, absolutely. So where I live in Ontario, I'm essentially surrounded by the Great Lakes, and I've always had a love of freshwater environments and the environment itself. Every science fair project I've done has been on environmental innovation and sustainability. Additionally, my dad is actually a commercial fisherman, and so some areas, um, specifically in Lake Erie, he is no longer able to fish in them due to harmful algae blooms, which is when there's a large overgrowth of algae that um, toxins can form, they're... Um, carcinogens as well, and even worse, when the um, algae blooms decompose, they absorb excessive amounts of oxygen, which causes hypoxia and dead zones. So anything that doesn't die in the lake from the toxins, now all of a sudden dies from the lack of oxygen. And so I've always, I thought it was a really interesting topic to look at a way to treat and prevent them, because the only solution we do have are algicides, which like herbicides and pesticides, while they kill the algae, they also kill everything else in the lake. And they still call the, cause the algae to decompose and remove all the oxygen. So I was looking at a natural sustainable solution to treat and prevent the harmful algae blooms. And so I was looking at using a keystone freshwater species, specifically Daphnia magna, which is like a little Pac-Man goes num 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 and is able to eat up all the algae um, before it decomposes to thus prevent hypoxia and dead zones and to also make sure that we can use our lakes for drinking, swimming, fishing, tour, um, any other tourism property as well. Cool. Uh, yeah, I, I love the analogy of a little Pac-Man as well. It, it, it definitely helps to provide a, a visual representation of, of what it is you're you're researching here in your in your, your project. Uh, so, why is this important? Why why is it important to to not have dead zones? It sort of seems like a, an answer. <laughs> you answer the question yourself there. But why is it important to not release the oxygen as you're as you're killing algae? Why is it important for it not to be you know a, a chemical herbicide equivalent? Well, absolutely. So over 300 harmful algae blooms were reported around the world in 2018. Harmful algae blooms destroy aquatic ecosystems, and when the algae decompose, they absorb ex uh, excessive amounts of oxygen, causing hypoxia and dead zones in aquatic environments. 
In fact, harmful algae blooms are one of the main causes of fish kills, and due to their harmful toxins, they make water bodies unsafe for recreational use. In communities around Lake Erie, a Canadian Great Lake significantly impacted by harmful algae blooms. These two factors contribute to an estimated 254 million euro loss to the Lake Erie economy, or 272 uh, million Canadian dollar loss to the Lake Erie mm -hmm. economy over a 30 year period if nothing is done to treat and prevent harmful algae blooms. In Greece, Italy, and Spain, the estimated economic cost of harmful algae blooms is over 300 million euro a year. Harmful algae blooms also block out sunlight, um, cause dead zones and release toxins, which destroys aquatic ecosystems. And it raises costs to drinking water treatment as it can contaminate drinking water treatment plants. And the toxins in harmful algae blooms are especially dangerous to young children and the elderly, and they have detrimental effects on First Nation and freshwater coastal communities around the world. Additionally, with climate change increasing precipitation rates, more agricultural runoff and fertilizer will enter aquatic environments through precipitation, which means that there'll be an increase in nutrient pollution in our freshwater ecosystems, which means that more and more algae will grow, causing all of these incredibly harmful effects. Um, additionally, harmful, the toxins, um, they have, um, for example, the Toledo water crisis in 2014. The city of Toledo lost water for about three or four days because of a um, harmful microsystem bloom in Lake Erie. So essentially, in order to ensure clean water access and healthy lakes for all and to support our fishing and tourism industries, and of course, to protect biodiversity, we need to be able to, to treat and prevent harmful algae blooms to ensure that our lakes can thrive. I mean, we do love clean water and we do love biodiversity. So <laughs> this sounds like a perfect project for those sort of things. Uh, uh, algae blooms natural? Like, why, why is this becoming such an issue now? Why is it something you're focusing on right now as opposed to you know, just letting it be? <laughs> Well, harmful algae blooms have actually been around for a long time. For example, in the 70s, um, that's when they really started to detect these blooms, and that's when everything started, they started trying to make like phosphorus free laundry detergent, etc. Um, however, um, again, with the increase of climate change, this means that we ha we're having heavier rainfall rates, which means that more and more fertilizer is being washed off the fields and it's going right into our lakes. Additionally, as the human population, has grown quite a bit from the 70s. It means we need to feed more people, which means farmers are using far more fertilizer, which is directly entering our waterways. So we're actually having a drastic increase in harmful algae blooms, and people are um, and with an increase in tracking, people are becoming more aware of them, as well as their harmful impacts and toxins. Um, but they've no, they've always kind of been a bit of a problem, but it's not really been a heavy or large focus on our lakes. Um, yeah. However. It's becoming more and more prevalent now with climate change, population increases, and of course, the economic implications. That's a, and that's the thing. I mean, everyone's always like, well, but, but if it's natural, it's probably fine. But the, the difference is that you know, we have created situations where it's no longer as natural as it used to be. And Perhaps things are changing. It's not natural. They're, they're changing so much quicker than than anyone was ready to, to be able to deal with them, right? So, yeah. Interesting, interesting project. I really like this. So clearly, you would have had to learn a whole lot that I imagine you're not covering in your pretty standard high school science classes. Uh, where did all of this information come from? How did you go about attacking the, the enormous amount of information I'm sure you would have had to take in? Um, so absolutely. So my general rule for science fair is I will not start a project without a minimum of four months of just pure research. Um, so essentially reading, um, when the pandemic hit, I remember going into lockdown and I'm like, I'm going to find an awesome science fair project idea. I'm not leaving lockdown until I have it. And so that was, I basically just sat and I was like, okay, I've always wanted to tackle harmful algae blooms. Let's see what I can do. So I just went and I spent hours reading online articles, watching informational videos, reading through scientific literature. Um, I also, um, I emailed my local conservation authority. I talked to my father and other commercial fishermen about how they're directly impacted. I read news articles. Basically, I read anything I could. And then um, I developed like possible like outlines of different experiments. And I even have a few textbooks that talked about nutrient pollution and nutrient loading, as well as like impacts of hypoxia. I also researched all sorts of different types of algae um, and which ones are toxin or more toxic than others and other impacts on uh, freshwater lakes. Limnology is my favorite field of science, which is the study of inland and freshwater lakes. So I always just, my friends joke that I'm a little lake um, encyclopedia because I'm always reading about it or learning as much as I can. But yeah, generally, a lot of the information just came from reading scientific literature and online articles and anything that I could get my hands on, as well as throughout the process. Sometimes if I have a question, I just go and I'll do a cold email and just blindly email either profs or, for example, the Experimental Lakes Association or a local environmental lab just to see if anyone can give me more information and details. 
so four months is a lot of research to do, uh, especially just the idea idea phase of things. I'm sure a lot of people listening to this episode might be like, oh, four months, that's, that's so much time. Uh, I don't have all of that time. But I think what they kind of miss is that if you don't spend so much time developing these ideas right up front, if you don't have that sort of preparation, then you spend the rest of your time trying to catch up and and deal with maybe things you missed in the original phase or, you know, having to change your experiment because you hadn't spent as much time, you know, on that idea phase, especially up front. Do you have any advice on how to keep track of all of this information? So when you're cold emailing, you know, environmental advisors or consultants and when you're reading all of these books and scientific research papers, where where are you keeping all of that information and how are you making sure that, you know, it's all, it's all in an organized fashion? Um, yes, but... Generally, my advice to anyone wanting to do science fairs to research, read anything and everything you can get your hands on, and don't be afraid to reach out to professionals or professors because they were once exactly in your shoes. Um, for me, I, I'm an avid note taker, so, and I also like physical copies. So if I had a textbook, I would usually use like little sticky tabs and I would mark things up and write things down in a little journal. If it's online articles, I would actually email them to myself and I have an email folder where I have all the links. And then I also go into either a Word or Google Drive document where I actually make almost it's like studying for an exam or a test and I have study notes on, okay, this is a picture of this type of algae. This is how it releases toxins. Here are all the zooplankton's pros and cons, which ones would be ideal. I have like a running list of all of my links and citations. Um, again, I stay very up to date with my emails and I again have a, a running document of here are my questions, here are my answers. I color code them. This is the answer from this person. This is the answer from that person. So it's really... Um, Almost like school is just really strict documentation, um, whether it's on an online living, breathing document or within your own binder in journal. And coming through all this, like processing all that sort of information, no doubt you had a bunch of different ideas about experiments you might be able to do. And, you know, you even mentioned that you had some you know, very initial thoughts on I could do this experiment and I could do it this way. How do you then go about deciding which of those ideas to focus on, which of those experiments to to take the leap of faith and and commit further further to. Absolutely. Well, going into the project this year, um, also my research time was a little bit cut down um, because I knew a lot about algae blooms coming into it from last year, and I knew that I wanted to further continue my research with Daphne and Magna. This was where um, that my mentor and friend from our local conservation authority, she knew these two um, evolutionary biologists at the University of Guelph who were studying Daphne and Magna and its evolution and history in the Great Lakes. And she was like, hey, you might want to reach out to them. Um, because with this project, I was really originally like I had this idea of testing with invasive species and doing more of like a climate test. And I ended up with something very different where I compared the genotypes and then I tested them with different pollutants and environmental conditions. And so I came up like with this very long, massive spreadsheet of possible experiments I could do and replicate some things. And I actually I did some calls and meetings and just talked to them. And they gave me feedback and advice on here are things that they know that's already been done. Here's a place where here's a registry where you can look at what research has been done so you can make sure that yours is different. Here are some things that we're interested in. Um, here are some articles we might suggest. And so it was more of a thoroughly looking and it's kind of like, nope, that's been done. Or nope, cool, what if I do this? Or wait, I don't have resources or access to those materials. Back to the drawing board. So it's kind of like just sitting there and almost logicking it through. And then also doing what you find to be the most interesting and could be the most important and also making sure that it has a real life application. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a lot of, a lot of different things to come up, but it is about what you have access to, what sort of prior knowledge do you already have? What do you find interesting and what do you want to learn more about? Um, I love that sort of advice that you've given there. So obviously, you know, you reached out to a lot of people to ask for advice. What sort of, what sort of groups of people, what sort of supporters did you have along the way in, in this project? What sort of mentors did you reach out to? Um, absolutely. So initially, um, Jessica Vanswell, she's the chief um, biology, freshwater biologist at the St. Clair Conservation Authority. She was really my, here's my, here's my network. How can I support you? And she was just wonderful. Um, there was um, from the Great Lakes Alliance and also from the University of Ottawa. She also works with Climate Change Canada, Marianne Racine. She's been very good on like lending me literature or this is something that's been done or here's a scientific process to do this. The local environmental science lab in Sarnia, so not less environmental. My apologies, my dog is barking at the mailman. Um, it's okay. Essentially, um, they basically they provide me with algae stock to feed my Daphnia and also on experimental techniques. Or, for example, because I culture my own Daphnia in my basement. If I have something wrong, I call them and I'm like, what do I do? And they're like, okay, change the lighting and setting temperatures and you'll be fine. Um, they, are, they are gods and they are wonderful. And then, of course, they're... Um, 
Dr. Re- uh, Rene um, Shabashamadvinlu, I know I'm butchering his last name, as well as um, Dr. Seth Rudman. So they're from the University of Guelph and University of Washington. They have been incredible with providing me advice. Well, they provided me with the Daphne Magna genotypes, very, very knowledgeable in providing me with but more proper scientific experimentation. So how to set up replicates and proper procedures, and of course, health and safety for managing the microcystis, which they also provided me with, which is a very, very toxic um, algae <laughs> um, that I was playing with. And they also gave me advice and guided me along in performing statistical analyses. Um, and so they've that, that's kind of been my general support group, of course. Um, and then my the Lambton College is in town, so I was able to borrow a hemocytometer from them and so to perform my algae cell counts. And of course, my science department head, Mrs. Yurkowicz at St. Patrick, she just, anytime I come in and I'm like, okay, I need these textbooks and I need like a jar of pipettes. And she's just like, here you go. So it's. Wow, you had such a wonderful and such a diverse group of group of people supporting you along this way. Um, I couldn't imagine how how incredible having that support network around you must have felt uh, Um, and how advantageous that was. Especially coming from a smaller community. Now, I do want to stress all of research, everything was my own. It was more these people are the, I need a material or I need a piece Mm -hmm. of information. But everything else was entirely on my own, my little basement limnology lab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's what we're looking for when when you're reaching out to mentors, when you're reaching out to supporters. You're not wanting them to do the work for you, but... You know, there is a reason you're reaching out to them and usually it's because they either know something or they have access to something that you don't have yourself. So how did you go about reaching out to these people? So how did, how did you build this network of supporters that helped you through this? Um, so for the first project in grade 10, it was just blindly emailing, hey, I have some questions about this. Would you possibly have some time to like either email me back or do a call? And then from there, it was these people that I had emailed. They're like, oh, we know someone. Here, go talk to them. So it was kind of a that's sort of how it all worked. It was just, you send a really, really polite email that's short and straight to the point. Also, it kind of helps if you mention your background and your credentials and everything. And then you just see where it goes from there. Mm -hmm. It's all about networking. I know it's a, it's a crutch that a lot of people say all the time, but it's it's not what you know, it's who you know. And to some extent that it is very much about building those connections and networking, building that, that list of people that you have access to, because you know, they're in your sphere of influence, as, as it were, but then the people outside of that sphere that you don't know are the people that are going to teach you something, something that you wouldn't have experienced yourself before. So it is about reaching like that next person that you don't know, know just yet. That's where the magic happens. So question from Prabhnor in the chat, wanting to know how long did it take you from idea to then, you know, getting your final conclusion and wrapping up your project? Obviously, we've talked about the four, the four months of research and ideation at the very start of the project. But then once you've decided on an idea and an experiment, how long does it then take to get you to, here are my results, here's my paper published, here's, <laughs> here's my project forward? Okay. <laughs> Two so years. We'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll say I started this year's project in about May. Uh, May of 2020, um, like I started the ideation um, and research phrase in May. So that was kind of May, June. I was, that was when I was reached talking with uh, Guelph and I was trying to logic out where exact, well, that was where I was logicing out. Where do I go from here in my current knowledge? And about in, I want to say around September was when I um, had, that was when I received the genotypes and that was my very first experiment. So that was, uh, I perform, for this exper- uh, project, I performed five experiments for a total of 195 tests. Each experiment lasted two weeks. So I remember, um, finishing up and performing all of my algae cell counts and uh, playing with microcystis in my kitchen on Thanksgiving. So that was um, one experiment. And then I all of the experiments were finished by about first week of February. And then from there, there was a week. What really neat product of my project was I measured the health metrics of the Daphnia magna. And so one of the ways I did that was by measuring their body lengths. Now, Daphnia magna are a teeny tiny little aquatic organism. So I used this website and um, process called ImageJ where you can take a picture um, and it can convert the pixels into millimeters. And so I remember spending a whole week, like finally measuring all of my Daphnia before and after in each mm-hmm. test. Um, and then from there, I just essentially I worked on the project board. I worked on my paper, I worked on my write-up. And that was, I had to have that done by April 10th, which was when the Lightning County Science Fair was. So that would be May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, 
about, about a year. Yeah, just under a year. And, and this is for then, a continuation project. Yes, this is for a continuation project. So com- like, uh, commu- cumulatively, it's two years of research. Mm-hmm. Wow, yeah. I mean, it, really, what we've been learning over all of these interviews is it can take as long or as short a amount of time as it really needs to, depending on what project you do and what your idea really is. Because you know, your experience were taking two weeks. Some people could design, test, destroy, <laughs> redesign, and then retest again, you know, multiple times a day. So. You know, that's not not something you can do with biology sometimes, which is which is quite interesting. <laughs> um, presumably, along that process, along you know a two year cumulative research effort, there were a few mi- mishaps and challenges. Do you want to talk about a few of those that you found and and how you dealt with them? Um, absolutely. So before I even started my other project, I had this one like really cool, awesome idea, but I made miscalculations, and I um, I had some plants involved. I was looking more at a like bioremediation effort and I caused some mass nutrient burning. (laughs) Um, And then um, this year, I guess one of the things was I used pond mud because I wanted to look at the, I studied the gut microbiota of Daphnia magna and I wanted to look at how naturally occurring microbes in pond mud could impact the Daphnia to maybe improve their gut microbiota so they could better consume the toxic algae. One of the issues is though that the pond mud has debris. So when I was like on my hemocytometer, which is a little ha- counting grid you put under a microscope, it made it really hard to identify the algae. Additionally, the reproduction rates of the Daphnia, which was something I also looked at, can't fully be controlled, even though I tested with neonates. So there are some times where you had larger amounts and less smaller amounts being reproduced, which always screwed up your averaging numbers. Um, other than that, there weren't too, too many hiccups. I mean, the Daphneads kind of like think one of those claw games. They swim very fast and they don't like being picked up by the pipette, especially I was testing with neonates, which are Daphnia less than 24 hours old to make sure I followed the most appropriate testing procedures. So it was, I mean, it always took a little while <laughs> to set mm-hmm. everything up. I can imagine, yeah. How do you stay motivated? How do you just like very quickly deal with it and move on? Because, you know, it's a, it's a long process. So that's a long time for you to be, you know, doing experiments and maybe it doesn't work. So then you have to try something else. How do you, how do you keep going with that every time? Absolutely. So I'm a very curious and very uh, determined individual. So when I have a goal, nothing's stopping me. And especially if it's something to do with learning and um, asking questions, I'm going to have so many questions or read as much as I possibly can. And generally this is just such a topic that I was just so interested in. And I was really, really like, I, I want to learn more. I love these little creatures. I want to protect our lakes. So it's making sure that you're doing something that's a topic you're passionate about and generally curious about because it will never feel laborious. Um, you will never get tired of it. You will. I was waking up at 4 a.m. in the morning to go culture my Daphne and make sure they had enough food and to run tests. I mean, if it's something that you're truly just that genuine, genuinely excites you, you will never lose motivation. That's yeah. That's good. <laughs> that's good. 4 a.m. Wow. Yeah, you are dedicated. Okay, I'm an early riser, so I'm usually up at five or six. But yeah, okay. <laughs> so, um, so obviously, you put in an enormous amount of work. Clearly, a two-year project. How then did it feel to you know hear your name called out as best project winner at Canada Wide Science Fair, and you know get get that accolade, get that acknowledgement for all the work, the hard work you've done? Um, absolutely. So I've been doing science for all of my life. I've met my best friends and the most incredible people through science fair. Um, and it's so very, very important, very big for me. However, I never, ever imagined um, being at that high of a level. I'd placed bronze at my first fair, silver at my second fair. So I was hoping for a gold would have been nice, but I was really just hoping to medal. And again, you're generally doing science fair for the experience to develop new skills, to network, um, and also to have fun. And so I remember sitting at home and um, now all of my friends that week, cause we were judging based on how many virtual sessions and judging sessions you had had. And I had five judging sessions on the optional judging day. Um, and all of my friends, including, um, they're like, you're in they're, they're like, you got it. Something big's happening. One of my friends was like, you're winning crystal. I know it. And I'm like, no, no, everyone calm down. There are so many other wonderful projects. It's, it's fine. I was, I was very adamant on, it was just, they had extra questions. There was no big deal. Of course, we get to the evening and we're sitting there and we notice um, Dominic hadn't announced the best senior discovery project. He kind of skipped over. I was like, what's going on? And of course, my one friend was a faster internet connection than me. There, my phone's like blowing up with congratulatory messages from them. I'm confused. I look up and there's my name on the screen in the confetti. 
and I just freeze. And I remember my mom was sitting there and she was taking photos of the screen um, when any when myself or any friends or people popped up um, so that she could send them to other people later. And I was like, did you get a picture of that? Did that actually happen? There's me just making it over to my mom. And we're just like hugging and crying on the ground for like a solid 20 minutes. It was just, it was absolutely incredible. I'm still still surprised, still shocked about it to, the, uh, to this day. Cause again, I'd never dreamed of reaching that level at the national fair. And I am absolutely honored and appreciative to this day that that was able to happen. Um, it was was a surreal moment. (laughs) You did an incredible project. Clearly you put in the time, you, you did everything right. You told a good story. You knew exactly what to say about it. You had a wonderful conclusion. And I mean, how can we not just congratulate you on such, such an like amazing, amazing achievement. Uh, and I mean, it hasn't stopped there, right? So, since Canada Wide Science Fair, you have now won the 2022 uh, Stockholm Junior Water Prize. And then you also went to USA, so the European Union Young uh, Contest for Scientists. And you, you placed in both of those as well. So, so do you want to talk a little bit about what happened? How, how, what happened after Canada Wide Science Fair? What have you been up to? Um, absolutely. So actually going into Canada Wide Science Fair, this, at my very first Canada Wide Science Fair in grade eight, I remember sitting at the table um, with Team Lipton. Um, my mom was a chaperone for the trip, and they had called up a special award for the Stockholm Canadian Stockholm Junior Water Prize. And so those three projects, that, um, that one for, were senior projects based on water science. And from the three of them, one of them would go through, they would all go through additional judging. And then one would win and get to represent Canada in Stockholm, Sweden at the Stockholm Junior Water Prize, which is a youth water science, international water uh, science fair only for water science. And it's also the highest um, accolade for youth water science in the world. Um, It's, I guess, like the junior version of the official Stockholm Water Prize, which is the uh, Nobel Prize for water, actually. Um, And so I remember sitting there and I was just like, I want to do that. That sounds fun. Like, I just I just wanted to go and I'm like, I'm going to be up there one day. And so going into this year when I was like, oh, wait a second, I'm a and you because at Canada, why you get to self nominate for the special awards. And so I got to the point where I was like, wait a second, I'm a senior project in water science. I could nominate for this. <laughs> and so I remember being so the most I was so excited when my name was called for the special award to do the additional judging for the Canadian Stockholm Junior Water Prize. And ad- again, UCs and Stockholm Junior Water Prize both require a whole different set of papers and videos and information and paperwork than the Candlelight Science Fair. So I remember as soon as Candlelight Science Fair ended, I was just doing the whole science fair process all over again to prepare my information for those events. I believe it was the evening of June 7th that I got the phone call that I was selected to represent Canada in Stockholm, and I was just entirely overjoyed. So that was in August, um, like the last two weeks of August. And it was probably the best week of my life. It was, I was with 58 other youth who were so passionate about water, water justice, but not only just science, they were all so diverse and had different experiences and backgrounds and other extracurriculars. And they were the most wonderful people who were genuinely curious about you and wanted to ask you hundreds of questions while you wanted to go and ask them hundreds of questions. And while we were there, not only did we have judging and like the general science fair things but we also had touring we got to go bowling one night we got to see the city of stockholm we got to visit one of their universities and attend their labs a highlight for me was visiting their nanotechnology lab which was wonderful we also um were introduced to xylem which is a water technology company we got to visit their research and development facility my one friend and i after judging snuck off and went to the abbey museum then we got to go see the canals and it was just it was wonderful and of course we get to the awards evening well, actually, before that, the judging was very interesting. It was my first, um, I wasn't sure what to expect, I guess, for in-person judging at a national fair, or an international fair, my apologies. And I was actually called in for an additional judging round after the judges have come by, and that was very similar to, for example, your 15 minutes at the Canada-wide science fair. But when I was called in separately, I was uh, had to face the entire jury. So it was a 30-minute additional judging period with all 12 members of the jury and think of like a thesis dissertation. They are going around the table, spit firing questions at you one at a time. One of them had my report up and they were actually quoting and citing my report. So on the second paragraph of page six of your report, um, you mentioned this. Can you elaborate on that, please? Like it was, it was a very valuable experience and I learned a lot from, but it was just very different than anything I had done before. And I remember, and the whole group, it was so, like, I was a little worried going into it that everyone would be very competitive, very cutthroat, but it was such a positive and welcoming community. And I remember all of us getting ready two hours before the award ceremony and dinner gala. We all really just wanted to look our best to get a really good group photo. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. And of course, we arrive and we actually have individual meetings with the Crown Princess of Sweden, as this is her patronage. And then afterwards, we have the Stockholm Junior Water Prize has this iconic flag parade where everyone gets to bear the country's flag and march in. And so we had done that and we're sitting in the awards ceremony. And I remember they had the head of the jury come on stage to present the reasoning before they announced the project that won. And I hear um, multifaceted, extensive bio-based research. And if you were to explain my project quickly, that's what you would use. And then I remember her specifically saying, the fight against harmful algae, algal, algal blooms has begun. And I immediately think it's not me. There are other people who studied algae, can't be me, would never be me in a million years. All of a sudden there's a drum roll and Canada's called and I'm, I freeze and I'm like, what do I do, what do I do? And my mom was in the back, so I just go and sprint. There's this video of me online, like sprinting in this gala dress and just bear hugging my mom and my national organizer, Heather Terrell. And then eventually running up, up on stage to, um, accept the award but that was it was a surreal experience and I'm I've made friends that I know will last last a lifetime that I've learned so much about water science water justice because again it's hosted along with World Water Week so we were able to attend conference sessions then and so then after that trip I returned home for my first week of grade 12 and then I packed <laughs> my bags again and I went off to the Netherlands for UCs which is the European Union contest for young scientists that was, again, another incredible week. So we were in Leiden, Netherlands, so about 30 minutes from Amsterdam. And it was a lot bigger than the Stockholm Junior Water Prize with about 130 or 133 around projects. Mm -hmm. But it was a very, a very interesting experience. Judging was very different than anything I had experienced before. It was far more um, casual and relaxed. The judges really asked you thought-provoking questions, like they wanted to know how you thought and and more about like kind of the design process and like the application part of your research, which was really interesting. And the people there were also incredible. Um, for example, we had like, I was in the biology and environmental row and we had like a dance party going down our aisle almost every day during judging. Yeah. Um, we got to do some canal tours and to, it was a beautiful cobblestone city filled with lots of canals. It was just such an incredible fun experience. And again, I know I've made wonderful friends who I will continue to keep in touch with. Oh, and, wow. Well, and again, going into it, um, as a guest country, um, we're limited to what pri which prizes we can and cannot win. Mm -hmm. So again, I was not expecting to win anything at all. I was really just happy to be there. And I'm like, oh, this is just a great week to meet new people and to travel. And so I'm sitting in the awards ceremony and then I'm calling. And I'm like, oh, wow. OK. Mm -hmm. So that was that was quite exciting as well. Yeah, I mean, Canada did incredible. Hans and Lewis as well, who we're yes. interviewing later today, um, were all, also there with you. Uh, yes. <laughs> again, congratulations. Wow, what what a wonderful, wonderful achievement. I have so many questions. What a cool experience. Uh, do you have some advice for students? Like, okay, let's let's talk junior soccer firstly, and that, that you know the whole thesis defense vibe yes. of the of the judging experience there. How, how did you center yourself? How did, how did you prepare yourself for that sort of judging, especially because it is quite so, quite different to what you would have experienced at a regional science fair and then at Canada Wide Science Fair? So I wasn't warned about it. I was just told <laughs> the jury wanted to speak to me and had more questions. Mm -hmm. And so I was shuffled. And so judging at the Stockton Junior Water Prize, like the 15-minute sessions where just judges came by, that was public and open. So people could come in and watch. Um, one of my really good friends, she went and actually took all sorts of action shots of me. So I went and took all sorts of action shots of her. Um, and it was like, it was wonderful because it was a great way for us to represent, uh, present our science to the public and the folks at the uh, World Water Week conference. However, when the jury had the extra question period, doors were locked. Um, it was only you in the jury in the room, which was very weird. Um, and yeah, they were just like, okay, we're going to go around and ask you questions. Like they were much more relaxed and casual in the other judging sessions, but then it just, the whole tone of everything um, turned quickly. Um, I guess grounding wise, I took a few deep breaths. And again, this is a topic that I've been researching for two years now. I spend my, I still spend time researching limnology and more about algae blooms. So it was kind of like, okay. I've read as much as I can. Um, if there's a question that you can't answer, you know you've done the best you possibly can. And also, there's no shame in saying, I don't know. Because again, we're not able to know absolutely everything. And so you you can say, hey, I'm, I don't really know, but I think this could happen, or that just requires further research, because that's another part of science. So that is always something safe to fall back on. And it was also a, 
kind of like, I'm, I know I'm going to learn from this. And so it was kind of like, okay, we're diving in. I often love to quote Ray Bradbury's first you jump off the cliff and then you build your wings on the way down. And that is exactly how that went. <laughs> yeah. So then contrasting to that, the users, users judging, very conversationalist, uh, you know, talk, talk us through a little bit about how you approach that style of judging as well. Um, so Renny Barlow had advised me that is a bit more of a casual, relaxed environment, but mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was that much casual and relaxed. For example, it was like you more sit down with the judge and you have a conversation about your project and why you did it. It's less you're directly being asked questions, like the questions will pop up, but it's more of, I guess it kind of has like a nice ebb and flow. Um, for example, one of the judging sessions I had, I sp it was about five minutes were spent of me talking about my research. And then the rest of it was the judge asking me, it was some of the most powerful questions I've ever been asked at a science fair, actually. So it was, why did you do the project? Um, who helped you? And if so, how did they do it? What would you have done if you didn't have access to the resources that you had? Um, and then, which that was really, really interesting and really made you think. And then there was a question on, okay, how can, what can you do to bring your product to a political, governmental, and, um, private sector or corporate level. Mm -hmm. And so it was more talking about the abstract things. And then he actually went in and we just spent the next rest of the 12 minutes of the judging session talking about his own research in his lab. Um, so it was very, very, um, very interesting. There was another judge. He's a professional science communicator in France. He came by to every single project. He had you give him a five minute pitch. And then he actually like gave you feedback and comments on how you can more effectively tell your story. And he also gave you feedback on your poster. Mm -hmm. um, so it was overall, it was a very interesting, exciting experience. I had one judge, she was a geneticist, which is wonderful. Cause again, in the Sar community of Sarnia, our only judges are engineers. <laughs> so I'm used mm -hmm. to having no one with a biological understanding judge my project. Um, even at the Canada Wide Science Fair, I know you guys work really hard to find people with wide, wide variety of knowledge, but there was really no one with a limnology background. It wasn't until the Stockholm Junior Water Prize where it was like, judges are my people they, 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 that was just like the, the questions they asked were just so wonderful I wanted to give them hugs because it was like these are the questions I've been training and waiting for and so of course when I had the geneticist judge she was all over the genotypes and if I was a part of the genome sequencing and everything which was it was wonderful because you could just tell how passionate and interested she was and then she went and talked about her background in genetics and what she looks at so it was yeah, it was just almost kind of like this, just having a nice, friendly conversation. The judge knows, learns more about you. You learn more about the judge. Um, and everyone learns and benefits from it. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you're calling this a friendly conversation? I feel honored. <laughs> uh, I think I think the, the key thing to take away from all of these experiences is that you have to be ready to present your project to just a wide range of people. You can't expect to have someone who is an expert in your field you know, you can't expect to have someone who's a science communicator. You don't even have to expect someone to be a, a scientist themselves, you know, but being able to present your project to the general public, to experts and to everyone in between, it's just such a, a key skill to have and something that everyone should be practicing. I mean, we've got people in the chat here and on Discord jumping in saying, whoa, what a busy and fun beginning of the year. Congrats. And I mean, that pretty much summarizes exactly what you've been up to the last six months and it has been a busy year for you. Thank you. I will say one of my favorite science communication stories um, UCs was public viewing, so they had elementary mm -hmm. schools come in. I, I, I feel like you haven't science fared until you've tried to explain zooplankton biomanipulation to a six-year-old Dutch child in broken Dutch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it, it's an adventure. I, I, I can imagine. Yeah. Uh, do you have any advice on distilling, you know, complicated science fair projects to not necessarily a six-year-old Dutch child in broken Dutch, but but to at least like to the general public or you know someone younger without the experience and knowledge you have. Um, absolutely. So everyone loves a story, right? You think of when you're little and you just, you're so excited for story time. So you want to try to create an aspect and element of narrative to your story. So I always start, um, with kind of like, here's the problem and here's why it's, or like, here's, you always start with something agreeable. So I always start talking about our beautiful, wonderful lakes. And then you're like, but here's a villain, harmful algae blooms. And then from there, there's this superhero that might be able to help reduce this. But we want to study more about what can make it stronger or what's its kryptonite, for example. And another powerful thing is analogies. So that's why I always love to use my little Pac-Man analogy and nom, nom, nom. Um, there's actually this wonderful article this Swedish company wrote about my project that seriously starts with, um, 
What are the similarities between Pac-Man and the species of freshwater zooplankton? Nom, 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 um, <laughs> says Annabelle <laughs> Rayson, the winner of the 2022 Stockholm Junior Water Prize. And I mean, it's hilarious. People have teased me for it, but it's a, mm-hmm. in effect, analogies work. It helps people to better understand things. Another thing is to avoid using overly complex language or analogies. Um, so, um, like for example, if there's like a, um, oh, no, not no over, not, um, or for example, acronyms as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Try to avoid those and try to almost bring things um, like down to an easier level for things to explain as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think I know what you're <laughs> saying about the analogies, what the, the extra pieces don't, don't go too complicated with analogies. Yeah. And this is something in a previous interview we had with, uh, with Christian, you can go back through our episodes. We, we talked about when, you, when using analogies, it's also important to define where the limits are of that analogy. So, so, the zoo penguin, it's not actually Pac-Man. It doesn't eat ghosts, you know, like it's very yes. important. To then also be clear about like just what part of the analogy are you, are you using right now and what is related. Don't take it so literally. It's just a fun storytelling device. <laughs> it's the same with the, you know, the conflict that you mentioned between you know, having a villain and having a possible hero as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, all very, very useful uh, storytelling tools that I highly recommend everyone, especially scientists, get into because, you know, Science communication, it's not, it's not a degree. It's not, it's not something that's only limited to a very certain subsection of the scientific community. Everyone is a science communicator as soon as you're interested or as soon as you're a curious, a curious mm-hmm. kid. So it's definitely something to be, be learning for us all. Um, where, where did this passion for science fair and scientific research come from? I mean, it's, it's so clearly coming through all of the stories you're telling. <laughs> um. Absolutely. So my mom was a high school and college biology teacher. And again, my dad being a commercial fisherman. So I've always had this huge love of our natural environment. I also, I was just always one of those really curious um, kids when I was little. So I, to this day, I'm so curious. People tell me I ask far too many questions. Um, so I'm always asking questions. And then I was always um, try to read or learn as much as I possibly can to find answers. Um, so that was definitely a huge part for me. And also the thing is I find our school system, um, or at least in Ontario, the curriculum, it doesn't allow for curiosity or creativity. It's write this science report in this way, following this procedure, it's underline it in this exact red pen. And before you even, perf- even if like the three times you'll perform an experiment, you're told what the results should be before you do it. And you're given the exact materials and procedure to do it. And I mean, if you think of all of our great research and um, research findings, Banting and Best, Mary Curie, there was no precedence or background. It was just pure experimentation. And general genuine curiosity okay what if I do this what if this happens um and so I find like being able to do science fair for me has been a way for me to demonstrate and highlight my curiosity and to find ways to answer my own questions and find my own solutions to problems that I personally care about and I know that impact the rest of the world yeah I mean that even answers my my next question was why should students do science fair I think that that pretty much summarizes exactly exactly it um, is there something about science fair specifically or, you know, the process of doing science fair that you find is your favorite? Um, yes. So one of the things outside of science fair that I dabble in is the world of social justice. I'm very passionate about helping people and improving the world around me. So it's the ability to look at a issue, um, whether it's environmental, societal, medicine wise, and finding a solution so that you can help people and make the world a better place. Um, additionally, I love the ability with science to have developed so many skills. I have like a pipetting reflex in my one hand for the amount of pipetting <laughs> I've done over the past two years. I've learned how to perform um, ANOVAs and advanced uh, master's level statistics, um, as well as you really improve your communication abilities and how to write a scientific paper and post your skills um, and your social skills as well and how to think on your feet when judges ask you questions. Additionally, through Science Fair, I've met the most incredible and amazing people. I always say this between whether it's mentorship or um, I remember going to my first Canada-wide Science Fair and I, one of my best friends through high school I met there for the first time. And then they introduced me to my other best friend. And it was, it's just this whole wonderful, lovely community. Um, yeah, <laughs> that, that exactly. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's time for a little self-promotion, but if you want to meet some Really cool science fair kids. Join our Discord. Join our Discord community. <laughs> Purple Samurai. <laughs> I mean, science uh, also given me the opportunity to travel the world, to go mm-hmm. inside different labs, as well as university opportunities and recruitment. It's just, you never know what's going to happen next. It's a whole new world out there, isn't it? <laughs> Everyone, do a science fair project. Do a STEM project. Just do it. Just do it. Please. <laughs> uh, <laughs> please. So 
you've done it to your project now. You've you've represented yourself at regionals, nationals, internationally, at specific science fairs, purely for water science, which is so niche, but love it. Um, <laughs> what comes next? Year 12? What's happening next, Annabelle? Um, absolutely. So I am hoping to attend ISEF in Dallas, Texas mm -hmm. in May, which is the International Science and Engineering Fair hosted in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, so that that would be exciting. And then additionally, I am actually volunteering with the local Lampton County Science Fair. So I'm going to be a volunteer judge this year and also help with registration. And there are a few youngsters that I've met over the years that I plan to mentor and help move along up this year. Wow, you're really ticking off, ticking off like it's a, like a bingo sheet of things to do when you get interested in STEM fairs. You're really trying to tick off every single box, aren't you? I love it. Thank you so much for uh, staying involved this whole time. Uh, thank you for volunteering at your regional science fair. It's so important. That's what we want. We want every uh, wonderful student to graduate and then re-volunteer and help the next generation. Um, I mean, my goal is to be a part of Team UB and be a blue shirt at nationals in a year or two when I'm at university. So. <laughs> Oh, interesting. I'll write that one down. <laughs> That's a good way to get yourself in. Um, why, is, there, is there like a dream you have being older? I imagine it's probably water science related, but I mean, I don't want to pressure you into anything, but do you have, do you have future dreams? Um, absolutely. So kind of, it's a, um, I'm looking at finding a way to combine my passions for water science, environmental science, um, economics and governmental policy, law and social justice together. So I'm looking at either becoming a research limnologist and obtaining my PhD in limnology, or um, it'd be amazing to work at the Experimental Lakes Association in Canada for the International in uh, Institute of Sustainable Development, or I'm possibly looking at becoming an environmental lawyer or intellectual property and patent lawyer. Ah, just a few different options for you. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Good luck. That's all I can say. Uh, I'll be here supporting you along the way, uh, championing for you. So... Super easy question for you now. We're almost at the end of the interview. Why is STEM important? <laughs> oh, my. That, that's a big one, actually. Um, no, no. <laughs> STEM is important because we require scientific, technological, mathematic, and engineering advances um, to generally improve life and improve the world around us. There are always going to be problems. There always have been problems, and new problems are going to be popping up all the time. But through channeling our curiosity and the knowledge we uh, currently have have had in the past, and the new knowledge, and by searching for new knowledge and performing new experiments and trying new things, and building and innovating, we can find solutions to these problems that will generally make the world a better place and improve life for so many others. Here, here, amazing. <laughs> yes, that that exactly. <laughs> Um, and so just because you've been giving us such wonderful advice and just such incredible words of wisdom this entire episode, do you have any final advice for people looking to get involved in STEM projects, science fairs this year? How do you choose an idea? How do you keep motivated? Where do you start? Oh, oh my. I guess first start um, by looking in your local community, kind of almost th um, think global, act local. Um mm -hmm. Also, don't be afraid, again, uh, research as much as possible. That is the most important step. It's, I, I'm telling you right now, all of my success is due to the background information I did prior. Um, research anything and everything you can. And again, do not be afraid to reach out to those professionals and professors because they were once in your exact shoes. Um, additionally, everyone loves to find people uh, passionate about a topic that they're passionate about. I promise you they will talk to you all day or email you at any time, um, depending on their availability, of course. And don't lose your curiosity. That is that is your superpower. Um, your curiosity is your motivation. It's your enthusiasm. And make sure, again, to find something and make sure that's a topic that you are genuinely interested in. Maybe it relates to you. Maybe it relates to your community. Or maybe you think, hey, I want to learn more about that. Because that means that, again, it will never feel like work. It'll just You'll be more and more motivated to wake up and do it again. There will be challenges. There will be a little hiccups. But I promise you a good night's sleep, um, a glass of water, and some more research can definitely help you out there. Um, and again, Ray Bradbury's first jump off the cliff, um, and then you build your wings on the way down. A lot of the times it feels like you might not know what you're doing, um, but I promise you we'll all work out in the end. Yeah, <laughs> end it right there. That, that's <laughs> perfect. Oh my gosh, what a fantastic episode today has been. Annabelle, thank you so much for being a guest on, on today's episode. This conversation has been full of inspiration, it's been full of motivation, gems of advice, I mean, incredible storytelling, covering experience, experiences and your entire science fair project and all of the 
local, national, international experiences you've had along the way. Uh, I truly hope that many of our listeners continue to reflect on everything that we've talked about today as they think about their own adventures in STEM. So again, I can't thank you enough for being here. I can't congratulate you enough for an incredible project and for an incredible uh, representation of Canada on the international stage. So uh, I look forward to seeing you at uh, either, you know, ISAF next year or Candlelight Science Fair, depending on which way you go. And uh, no doubt I'll be following your career very closely because I think you're only just getting started. <laughs> well, thank you so, so very much for giving me this opportunity to present and talk about my experiences. For sure. And I mean, everyone in the Discord is saying a huge congratulations and a fantastic job. Uh, you're an inspiration to us all. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us in this episode of Why to How, a podcast where we explore adventures in STEM. If you liked this podcast, consider leaving us a like on our social media. It's just ysc.sjc on Facebook and Instagram, ysc underscore sjc on Twitter, or join our Discord, it's Purple STEM Wave. You can find the link on our website, youthscience.ca. Please leave us a comment with your favourite part of the interview and let us know your own thoughts on the topics we discussed. And if you liked it, please do share a link to the podcast or YouTube video with friends who you think would love to follow along. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, leave us a review as it really does help us reach more people. We'll have another amazing guest for you on the next episode, so stay tuned for more. Until then, have a wonderful day and stay curious.